Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's edition of the MotorOne.com podcast. This week, we lost a giant of the auto industry, Lee Iacocca. A veteran of both Ford and Chrysler, Iacocca stamped his mark on both automakers, giving one an enduring icon and saving the other from the brink. He was considered one of the greatest CEOs in any industry. And on this episode, we'll be discussing his legacy and some of our other favorite automotive CEOs. Joining me is MotorOne.com senior editor and serial non-complainer, Greg Fink. How are you, Greg? Great. How are you doing, John? Good, good. I'll explain that later, by the way. Also with us, and for the first time ever, is MotorOne.com Latino managing editor, Simon Gomez. How are you doing, Simon? I'm doing great. How are you, John? I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, it's exciting to have you on. Um, and it's a great time to let our listeners and the readers of Motor One know that we just launched this new edition, MotorOne.com Latino, that you are leading. Can you tell us a little bit about it? It's online right now. We have a whole bunch of content, very good, very curated, very high quality content. Uh, mostly uh, our adapted notes from the U.S. sister site, and but we're going to start doing our own things as well soon enough. And and uh, we're I have a team of writers there that I'm very proud of. They're very good. Uh, these two guys, uh, Gabriel here in Miami and Francisco in Buenos Aires, they're you know hitting it out of the park constantly and consistently. So I, I am very happy and I am very optimistic of where we're going. Yeah, I'm really excited too. I've been in this industry a long time and and um, I have uh, worked on a lot of different um, country editions of uh, car websites. When I was at Autoblog, we had international versions. And of course, at Motor One, we have 11 um, 11 now international editions of Motor One written in 10 languages. Uh, but this one is most exciting to me just because I know the Hispanic community in the U.S. Um, is crazy about cars and we've never really been able to write for them until now. Yes, we um, are. Also, this shouldn't this shouldn't be confused with MotorOne.com uh, Spain, um, which we also have and is also in Spanish, but that's all about the Spanish market over in Europe. This is all about the U.S. market. This is a Spanish language version of Motor One U.S., um, and you guys have been doing a great job so far. It launched a couple weeks ago, and like you said, your team is uh, hitting it out of the park with keeping up with the content that the English language U.S. edition is producing and making sure that that same content gets out to the Spanish-speaking audience as quickly as possible. And yeah, you're right. We're going to get into some original content soon. So um, so yeah, it's exciting, and it's great to have you on the podcast. I hope this will be the first of many appearances. I hope so, too. Okay, so let's let's hop into the big news of this week, which is sad. Um, it just happened last night, uh, the night before we're recording, and and it was Lee Iacocca's passing. Um, he was ninety four, um, which is a, a ripe old age, and and certainly a well life lived uh, for one that's gone as long as that. Um, when I was reading about him today. Um, it was crazy because I read he joined Ford Motor Company in August of 1946. That's how long he's basically been in uh, the auto industry, uh, which is crazy. So let me let me go through kind of the greatest hits of his career, uh, and then we'll talk um, talk about kind of its effect, you know, his significance and and some stuff that we're particularly um, impressed by. So he joined Ford and he kind of rose through the ranks very quickly. He started in engineering actually, but then he moved over to sales and marketing. But what he's most famous for at Ford was the Ford Mustang. I mean, without this guy, we wouldn't have the Mustang. We wouldn't have the whole pony car segment that survives to this day. That segment has, uh, kind of waxed and waned. Uh, but right now I would say it's at a high watermark and that, you know, we owe that star to him. After he left Ford, and um, he kind of left Ford because of some differences he had with Ford management, um, particularly Henry Ford II. When he left, Ford was doing great. Huge profit the year he left, and it was just, it sounds like personal differences. Chrysler quickly recruited him, snapped him up. Part of his story, this amazing part of his story, is that he took some projects from Ford that no one at Ford wanted to do, and since he was put in charge of Chrysler, he had basically the green light to do them. And he brought over some of his cohorts from Ford to do that. Two things in particular are part of his legacy over at Chrysler. One 
is introducing the K car, uh, which spawned many variants and is one of the things that um, brought Chrysler uh, back from the brink in the early 80s. The second is the minivan. Um, he brought the idea of the minivan over from Ford, uh, where it was kind of laughed off and, and disregarded. Um, and he launched it at Chrysler with the Dodge Caravan and Plymouth Voyager in the early 80s. And it's interesting that just a few weeks ago, Chrysler debuted a version of the Chrysler Pacifica minivan called the Chrysler Voyager. So it's, it's interesting that they brought that name back from the original minivan. These were two great things that he brought to Chrysler. Again, these cast-offs from Ford. He also did another, a couple other things at Chrysler that I don't think many people remember as well. One is that he got a bailout from the U.S. government. I think the late 70s or, or very early 80s for Chrysler. They were on the brink of bankruptcy, and he basically made the argument that uh, Chrysler is too big to fail. That is, is an argument that wasn't used again until about 2008, when both GM and Chrysler had to use it again at the beginning of the Great Recession to be bailed out by the U.S. government. So he kind of set that precedent. The other thing, and this is perhaps the most significant thing he did for Chrysler that I don't think people talk about enough is um, Chrysler bought AMC when he was uh, leading the company. When they did that, they acquired Jeep as well. And right now, Jeep is the crown jewel of Chrysler. It is perhaps the most valuable brand that the company has. And that all happened during his tenure at the company during the 80s. Uh, and probably the la the very last thing he did, which you really can't give him credit for other than giving it a rubber stamp, is that on his way out the door, he gave Bob Lutz permission to go ahead with the Viper. That was in the early 90s. That was kind of one of one of the last things he did. Really an amazing career. And then, of course, he's written books about his management and running companies and, and business in America. And so he's famous for that as well. So what do you guys think, you know, having gone through his litany of accomplishments, what do you think is the most significant thing in that that list, uh, Greg? I'm going to go with that. We're looking at the guy who I think invented the crossover. Mustang. What was that? Just a regular family sedan with a sports car? Crossover. Then the minivan. What was that? Just a big van mixed with a wagon. Crossover. So every you know crossover we see today owes a legacy to Lee Iacocca, I think. Well, he definitely thought outside of the vehicle segments, right? He, he was, I think, I think you're right. You could look at him as the guy who was looking for white space in the industry and then would would help create a car to fill that space. The minivan is a perfect example. Um, and the Mustang too. What about you, Simon? What stands out in his um, resume to you? Well, I think that Greg forgot about another crossover that that uh, Ayacoca invented, which is uh, the Lincoln Continental Mark III. He just got a Thunderbird slapped a Rolls Royce grill on, on his front and crossover. But no, seriously, um, I, I think the Mustang, the Mustang is, is, is going to be his more lasting legacy is the thing that everybody remembers him from. He, it, it was his, his drive, his, his energy, the one that, 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 that made this car happen. He put together this group of thinkers among, in the former company that was known as the Fairlane uh, Committee. They used to meet weekly, almost secretly at first, and, and they were trying to figure out what, what was going to be the, 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 the next, next big thing in the 1960s. The, 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 the newer generations were very, very different. And they sit down and they figure it out and they hit it out of the park. They, they made this thing that, that, that was a cultural revolution that, you know, the, 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 um, the arrival of the Formosa on the market was something very different, not, not like anybody had ever seen before. People breaking the windows in the showrooms, sleeping inside the cars, f fist fighting each other for, for the right to buy a single example and the dealership those were that's what the first weeks of the Mustang uh, were like and uh, and they end up you know selling four times as many cars as they were expecting to sell the most optimistic uh, um, projections that another thing that I wanted to mention about uh, Lee Iacocca is that it's maybe not as nice but in 1995 three years after he left Chrysler he joined Kirk Kirkorian the famous corporate raider, they tried to, to, to make a hostile takeover of the company, which was repealed successfully by Chrysler. But in my opinion, the opinion of many, and I'm not very original saying this, but 
it was this this attempt to 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 take over Chrysler what pushed them into the hands of of Daimler Benz then, and you know. I'm not going to go into that history, but, but we well, all know. And then, uh, uh, <laughs> and then after that, Chrysler has had a string of, of owners or, yep. and or partners um, that it's really, uh, of course, you know, right now it's with Fiat and is, is humming along fairly well. But um, yeah, you're right. Um, that That is something. He, yeah, there were some there were some dark spots in, in his career oh, as yes. well. Um, he was at Pinto. Ford. Yeah, I was just going to say he was at Ford when the Pinto um, scandal happened mm-hmm. with, um, you know, when it was found they could uh, basically ignite from rear end collisions because of the the fuel filler neck would detach from the fuel tank. Um, so and then we already mentioned the bailout, you know, it's it's not uh, not exactly a great mark on your record when you're kind of the first businessman to go hat in hand to the U.S. government asking for a bailout. But that's what happens when these companies get so big. Um you know, I, one thing I always remember about the Mustang in particular is how popular it was when it launched. Um, the original forecast uh, for, and I think it was, you know, like the 1964 and a half or whatever the first year was, uh, was 100 units uh, sold in the first year. That was what they were targeting. They passed that in three months. Um, the the end by the end of the year they had sold three hundred and eighteen thousand. Uh, that would be an amazing amount today, uh, where people probably buy more a lot more cars than they did in the mid sixties. Uh, but that's how popular this thing was. And you're right, like people waiting in line and and um, you know being crazy for this car. It also was one of those cars that created a new segment where Ford's competitors immediately had to enter with something, you know, and thus were born Camaro and Challenger and, and other um, cars from now defunct brands that were trying to recreate the success. Um, So yeah, it just, there's not many people who has, have had as big a mark on the auto industry um, as well as done it twice at two different automakers. That's, I think what is most impressive to me. Um, but it also got me thinking today about CEOs in general. And I think for the most part in the auto industry, CEOs aren't usually well known, especially to like just average people out there. Maybe if you're a real diehard automotive enthusiast, you could name the, um, CEOs from, from the major automakers, but normally they're a little bit behind the scenes, but even if they are behind the scenes sometimes they're still have a major impact on these companies. And, and I still have some of my, you know, some that stick out to me as, as really significant or my favorites. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, who, who our favorite automotive CEOs are. So, um, Simon, why don't you start? Who's, who's the one CEO that sticks out in your mind but, besides Lee Iacocca? Yeah. And I have to go back to Ford and I would say that Alan Mulally, uh, he's, uh, one of the, on some heroes of, of, of the last recovery, he managed to avoid going to bankruptcy in order to save the company, which he found in a, in a horrible, horrible shape. I remember that... And, and avoid going to, you know, uh, avoid going to the government like Lee Iacocca did. I mean, he was, Ford was the only domestic automaker to avoid having to go through that process. Yeah, it's the, it the only one left. But Mulally had many, many qualities that, that, that are very contradictory. What, with what we have in our minds of, of you know, the, the uber macho automotive CEO with a cigar in his mouth, just like Ayacoco was. He was a so spoken person. He, he, he wore uh, leather vests. He, he didn't wear pinstripe suits. He was very approachable. I remember talking to him on more than one occasion during the auto show. He just was there walking around, looking at things, talking to people. And he had a very uh, methodical uh, approach to management. He met a lot with people. He made them go over and over things until no errors were left in whatever it was that they were doing. Uh, and he, I, I think that, that his only failure, apparently for, for, you know, just judging by the last few years at Ford, is that, that when he left, that culture left with him. And, and, and the old way of doing things there seems to be back in full force. 
but but I think it's a fantastic guy. He did great things for Ford. He put him back in play in, in a way that many people were thinking wasn't possible. I remember I was in New York in, in the other show, maybe in 2000, and he was hired in 2006, I believe. So this probably was in 2005. And this very super famous old school car journalist, which I'm not going to mention, was talking to somebody and I was eavesdropping as I should have. And, and he was saying that, that this, this guy, Mulali, they're about to hire, is gonna be there just to liquidate the company and save as much money for the company as possible. I was heartbroken because, you know, coming from such a giant uh, figure, this, this, this declaration, I completely believed it. And I, and I said, oh my God, this is, this is horrible that what's happened. That, but fortunately, that wasn't the case. He did exactly the contrary, he saved the company. And Ford is, is lucky to have had him. I hope they, they bring back his, his lessons and start doing things the right way again. What I remember from Mullally is that he came in, in, like you said, in 2006 and had a lot of dismantling to do because Ford had just gotten very bloated. What I remember, some of his biggest moves were, was getting rid of the, what was it, uh, the Premier Auto Group, selling Jaguar, selling Land Rover, uh, selling Aston Martin, selling Volvo, and reducing Ford's stake in Mazda. But, so he really just, you know, focused the company down to its core brands. Can you, um, can you imagine that he even wanted to kill Lincoln? But, and, and, and the family didn't let him, but can you imagine if Mulali had come to Ford in an era pro, like full prosperity, maybe in, 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 by the time that Jack Nasser got there and had all these properties, the things that, that he could have done, the, 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 the company that Ford could have been. If he got, got in there when, when, when the cows were fat and, and, and money was plentiful, instead he had to, to sell all these properties, which I don't know, maybe, maybe that was the right move under any circumstance. Who knows? Well, I think that's why, I think that's why he brought, why they brought him in. I think he was the kind of CEO you bring in when you need to cost, uh, cut costs and shrink down to uh, a manageable lean size. So I don't, I don't know. That's a good, good. What if experiment, a thought experiment to think about if he had come in when the, the money was flowing and didn't have to cut uh, nameplates, what would he would, what would he have done? But remember he came from Boeing. That's what made him perfect was Boeing was, you know, a, a large, company that manufactured a very complicated product, which is exactly what Ford was as well. He came, Different industries, but a lot of crossover. He came from Boeing driving a Lexus. That's um, right. Yeah. And he got some flack for it too, yeah, before he had to switch to a Ford product. Yeah. I wonder who he um, drives today though. I'd like to know. I don't know. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to peek in his garage. Greg, what about you? I am not as savvy when it comes to CEOs as I am with the products they sell, but you know, being in this industry, you pay attention and I don't know if I have a favorite CEO, but someone who has continued to impress me and I think we'll, we'll look back on as being a really good leader is Akio Toyota at Toyota. And he's been there for about a decade now, and we've just watched Toyota go from a once really giant Japanese automaker to a little bit of a lull period in the early to mid-2000s, save for the hybrids, which is a really big thing, to right now coming very strong. You know, they've got Supra, so they're doing deals with... BMW, they've got this new electric platform coming out with Subaru. This company went from just being kind of what's going to happen, its products aren't quite where they used to be, to, wow, they're really looking toward the future. Yeah, Akio Toyota is an interesting choice. Definitely, I think, more of a, a lesser known CEO, at least in, in the US, um, compared to some of the, the domestic automaker CEOs. But I would give him credit because... He came in where I would say Toyota was at the top of its game, a powerhouse. And he really, he hasn't let it slip too much. I think, you know, that's the, the, the danger, the risk. When you come in after somebody has built the company up to an amazing size and it's doing so well, and basically you have everything to lose. And he's really kind of, I think, held the bar for Toyota. Um, you know, I don't think Toyota has, hasn't really been anyone's most exciting company automaker in the last 10 years maybe they're getting back to that with the supra um and you know they've won uh le mans a couple times now so you know they they stay in it but he's really i think um steered the ship and kept it on track and not really lost much ground if any that were built up um before he got there so yeah that's a decent choice well the other um, thing too is he's a race you know he races 
privately, I don't know if privately is the right term, but I'm sure he's paying money to race. You know, it's not, he's the greatest race car driver, but he enjoys racing cars. So you can see with Supra, 8.6, you know, he enjoys passion in cars, but he's also able to see where money can be made. So he understands a Camry still needs to be a Camry. And the new Camry is better than a lot of past Camrys. So it's clearly getting a little more passion in those cars too. But there is a line where it's like, yeah, it would be nice if every car drove like an 8.6. But the reality is that's not necessarily where the money is. And I like that he's a guy who kind of can see where like, okay, let's throw passion into this project. And all right, this is a project where it's here to make money. Let's make it a great car for what the consumer in that segment wants. Yeah, that's a great point. I always respect the CEO that that uses their cars, especially when they they race them. And and that's definitely a more intimate um, way of knowing your product than, you know, like, say, an Alan Mulally, where you're just driving the car to and from work <laughs> and your last car was a was, you know, a competitor's. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that was a great choice. So my, my choice is I don't know, you're either going to think my choice is lame or brilliant. So I'm going to pick Elon Musk. Um, even though I don't even know that most people would consider him an automotive CEO because he came from the tech world, having been a co-founder of PayPal. Um, yes, he's the CEO of Tesla, but he's also the CEO of SpaceX and a bunch of other companies. So he's really not a typical automotive CEO. Um, that's one of the things I think is interesting to watch him operate in this automotive industry in ways that are just so strange and foreign and different than what we've seen automotive CEOs do in the past. Um, I also think it's a it's it's so fascinating to see a CEO that's very similar to like a Steve Jobs operating in the automotive space. And you were talking, uh, Simon, a little bit before about like when the Mustang debuted and people were lined up around the corner. I think not. I, I don't know if this has happened since then, except for Tesla, where people are as excited about a car as they were for, you know, the next iPhone when Steve Jobs was alive. For better or worse, I think he has that quality of creating a reality distortion field around his company and his products and what he does. And Steve Jobs had the same thing. Um, and, you know, that is a for better or worse, because it creates a whole giant group of, of fanboys that that basically love the the company the product and the man uh, without question and and blindly um, and that's not good I mean every company should be considered with some level of objectivity um, but at the same time he's also annoyed and angered people where people just write him off and his company because they don't like him and and I don't like that either I think it's you know, I think it's, he's fascinating to observe. I, I don't see the company as heading for utter failure, nor do I see the company as the greatest thing ever and will overtake the entire industry in two years. I'm more of a, this is an amazing thing that's happening. I'm going to enjoy observing it and we'll see where the next year leads us. But it has been, he has been a fascinating CEO to watch as he runs this car company created from scratch, unlike any car company that's run today. I find it very, very interesting. Do, do you know who re he reminds me of? Uh, the Who's first that? the first Henry Ford. Because like I said, he created, oh. he created this company from nothing. He, he's a larger than life personality. Uh, he is used to have his way on things for better or worse. And uh, he's, he's a giant, giant personality. It's like, it's, it, it reminds me a lot of Henry Ford the first. And and who knows? Maybe that's 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 going to have a consequence eventually. He he. I don't know if if this is going to be the 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 equivalent of what for more co for more company was in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. But 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 it's the revolution it represents is kind of analog to that. I think. Well, and what I think is interesting is that the company is so wound up with the man. Right. Like you can't separate Elon Musk from Tesla and his words, his actions have material effects on how people view the company, um, the stock price, whether or not the cars are bought like that type of figure doesn't come around very often in any industry. Um, I don't know that it's maybe it hasn't been in the automotive industry since since a Henry Ford, uh, one, you know, the first or the second. Uh, but. You know, so it, it, like I said, fascinating to watch. Uh, you're either a lover or a hater, um, but you know, 
time will continue to tell whether this man's a genius or or a carnival barker. And <laughs> I like to and, think of whether he'll be John DeLorean or he'll be Steve Jobs. Whoa, that's right. And, uh, John DeLorean is a great uh, great name to bring up when we're talking about CEOs because that's a that's a guy who's probably would you'd put on the list of worst automotive CEOs of all time. He was president. Greg, he actually had a different CEO, but he was president of DeLorean Motor Company. A uh, fair fair distinction. I but I would say even or though founder, he made, there was a different CEO of DeLorean. Even though he made very poor choices, you can't uh, deny that he passionately wanted his company to survive, and he was willing to illegally sell drugs to make that happen. So, you know, there was passion there, uh, just a little misplaced. Um, so, uh, very good discussion. I want to I wanna keep moving, though, and there was some uh, a couple interesting pieces of car news that I think are worth talking about. Um, the first is an extension of our last podcast uh, discussion, which was all about the Camaro and the news that the Camaro might die after the 2023 model year. Um, we've had some speculation that that if it goes away, it may come back as an all electric pony car. Um, the, 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 the reasoning for this, the, the argument is somewhat thin. Uh, however, there's, uh, I'll, I'll try to lay it out as clearly as I can. For one, one of the, the lead, um, product managers for Camaro was moved over to the electric car division at, uh, GM. Um, so they've kind of moved a performance guy over into the electric car division. And one would think that him bringing that expertise there means that there's going to be an, uh, uh, an electrified performance product. And that could come be, you know, be with the name Camaro. The, the other, um, the other thing is that we were, we all seem, it, it seems to be somewhat certain that the, that GM has no plans, um, for the current Camaro after 2023. And basically the platform it's on, the alpha platform, is uh, what GM considers a legacy platform that it's, that it's going to stop supporting at some point. They will have a rear-wheel drive platform after that. It'll be one of four platforms. It doesn't seem likely that it's going to be used you know, for another big V8 honking uh, muscle car. So... I, you know, whether or not this is true, um, I don't know. And I don't, I, I don't think it's way too early for any of us to argue whether, whether it is or not. However, I keep coming around to this idea of electric muscle cars. And the reason is because while well, Ford will be bringing a hybrid Mustang, they will be building a Mustang inspired electric crossover. Um, and Dodge has publicly talked about the only way to add more power to the Challenger is to, to make it a hybrid, to add electrification. And then we've got this speculation about the Camaro. And remember, Chevy did produce an electric Camaro. There's the E-Copo, uh, which is the electric Camaro drag, drag car. They've dabbled in it. Do you think that the muscle car fanatics out there, the buyers, the, the real loyal people who are buying Mustangs, Camaros, and Challengers right now could ever get behind electric versions of those cars. Um, I, I have a hard time believing that that is going to be an easy transition. Uh, Greg, what do you think? They're going to have to. I think at a certain point, most vehicles are going to be electric. But uh, I don't know if it's going to need to happen very quickly. I still don't, you know, I take this report with a grain of salt. This was a lot of, hey, we saw a guy move over to here who used to be there. And thus, that guy was on that. So maybe he's part of this. And thus, the Camaro might now be elect an electric crossover. And it could be. As you said, Ford has said that they are going to make an electric crossover inspired by the Mustang. So it wouldn't surprise me if Chevy goes a similar route. But I don't think that means this is going to necessarily overshadow the entire Camaro. Could. Camaro could die, but Camaro could live sub you know at the same time. I think it won't be a drastic switch. I don't think all of a sudden in like 2025... We're going to go from V8 powered Camaros and Mustangs to all electric Camaros and Mustangs. I think electric electrification will sneak in uh, like it is uh, very soon with like a hybrid Mustang or like an, a, um, a Challenger with some type of an electric assistance to get more torque, like in a, in a, in a drag race mode or something like that. Automakers are going to have a really hard business case to keep producing V8s just for your Mustangs, your Camaros and your Challengers. I would say... You know, rather than go from V8 to 
turbo turbo V6s and, and to keep modifying that, you know, if you look at it from the sense of, well, if we want the fastest cars, if that's what is important about muscle cars, I don't know, maybe going all electric uh, right away is a good plan because, I mean, look at look at the Teslas out there that are some of the fastest cars in the world. Um, and they're not even supercars, they're sedans, you know? Um, you throw that, a, a powertrain like that into a muscle car and you could have incredible uh, quarter mile times, incredible lap times. Um, but the thing is, I, you know, I feel like there's so much uh, emotion and image tied up in a V8 burble uh, with a muscle car that I just, I just don't know if that, that, um, that circle can be squared um, with those buyers. Uh, what do you think, Simon? I don't know. Well, change is always painful. And uh, I will never forget, like I was in, in a reunion of, in a meeting of, of, of some Corvette club in the middle of Florida, and somebody was saying that he would never again buy a Corvette because he didn't have round, the new one, the C7, they have round headlight, uh, rear lights. But apart from that, I think that, that Chevy if 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 this if this is true of this if this has any any semblance of truth, they could be onto something, you know. Because while Chrysler or Dodge and Ford are going at it gradually, creating first, you know, hybrid versions that probably plug in hybrid versions until the eventually uh, electric pony car happens, Chevy would have leapfrogged them with their electric Camaro, and 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 will probably get some advantage there over them. I don't know if I'm making any sense. But you are, but and, and I, I let me take it one step further. In Matt like right now I think we are we are in the midst of a muscle car horsepower war. Imagine if these cars were electric and that power war were happening. Like I mean we're talking uh, easily nine second uh, quarter mile times straight from the factory like <laughs> like that's what these cars could do with that amount of power that amount of torque at zero rpm uh, all that all of that stuff I mean it, it, we would be seeing probably the fastest most fun to drive muscle cars we've ever seen I, with a switch to electric I, I have zero but doubts you, about you, it I'm, I'm just I, I just think that that there's some there's going to be some resistance. I don't think it's going to be significant, to be honest. People are going to love that eventually, and the younger people are going to lead the way, as they should. That's true. As they That's should. That's true. I, and look, it also depends on um, on some of the other numbers, you know, like range and and battery recharge time and all of those things that I think. Most automakers besides Tesla haven't really um, figured out the right equation for, um, you know, so far we're getting a lot of sub 250 mile range electric cars. And until you get, I think, the 300 mile capable ones, like people just have a hard time seeing them as anything more than a second car. Yeah. Maybe that's OK if you're if you're buying it as a muscle car. But um, and also, but yeah, I, I, like and also fast charging times. Fast charging times, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's I don't know. Maybe they will have you know a digital soundtrack to recreate uh, the sound of a V8 engine or something. And and I could see I, I I would bet if they did that, they would go so far as to like <laughs> make some kind of uh, weight in the car like vibrate to make it feel <laughs> like your your engine's idling. I could see them going so far as to have like the, I wouldn't the mind that V8 I, package. I wouldn't mind that at all. <laughs> yeah, that'd be that'd be hilarious. Um, so the, the other piece of news, um, is about the Corvette and, uh, the final C7 seventh generation Corvette has been built and it just went up for auction, um, for charity at Barrett, ja uh, Barrett Jackson's Northeast auction. And it sold for a record $2.7 million. Now that's a record for a car sold for charity at auction. Um, and we, we've seen this happened tons of times where an automaker will auction off either the first car ever, like they just auctioned off the first Supra of the latest generation, um, or they'll auction off the last one. But 2.7 million is like two and a half times the highest price I've ever seen for, for one of these cars. And I'm shocked by it because it's just the last car of a generation and there's going to be another gen like it, it, it's not like the last Corvette ever, uh, nor is it like 
the, you know, nor was the C7 like the be all end all of Corvette generation. So I don't, I don't really, I can't really understand why it went to 2.7 well, million. Well, is, is, the, is, the, um, is the last front engine Corvette in a while? Yes, that is its claim to fame, the last front engine Corvette, because we have the mid engine one replacing it as the eighth generation. Um, so I guess I guess that's the a good a reason as any. Maybe it will. Do you, do you think it'll keep that value though at two point seven million? I uh, know, but if the tax write off's good enough, you know, it was a charitable <laughs> donation. It is a charitable donation, and uh, I believe the, the the charity I forget the name, but it goes to building houses for um, um, severely injured veterans. So a great cause, and I'm super happy they got two point seven million. And maybe the guy who bought it doesn't care what it's worth and knows it'll probably have a significant value but just wanted to make a, a really big donation to a great cause but oh that that was uh, i was shocked when the gavel fell at 2.7 million um all right well we'd love to hear uh what you think about the stories we've been talking about specifically about lee iacocca if anybody has um if you have some great stories or comments on um the life and career of lee iacocca we'd love to hear them uh you can find us on facebook and twitter at motor one com um or you can visit us on our website motor one.com where you can talk to us in the comments uh, coming up, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. But before the break, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So please subscribe so that you're sure to get the next episode when it comes out. Uh, during the next part of the show, we're going to talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today I'm going to start with you, Greg. And the reason I refer to you as a serial non-complainer is that you had a car that was definitely worth complaining about this week, and I didn't hear a peep from you. So, so tell us what you were driving. I am driving the 2019 Mitsubishi Mirage. And uh, it is a mirage of what you think a good car is supposed to be, and then you get in it and you realize... It's not that good. Uh, it's fine enough. It's a car. Let me let I me let it. me ask a couple questions. Um, what is the as tested price? I want to say sixteen thousand nine hundred something. That's actually more than I thought. Like, yeah, I thought. it is not as cheap as you would expect, considering it only has seventy eight horsepower. Oh my god! There should be like a law against that. Like that that does not seem safe on U.S. roads. It doesn't feel very safe either, I hate to say. I mean, it's fun to drive in its own weird way because it's very light and it, you know, everything kind of moves in a gentle, slow way. Like, be really fun to rally cross, I feel like, because it's slow enough to not get in too much trouble. And it's like the suspension's very cushy, so it'd probably handle bumps really well. If I could find one for cheap with a stick shift, this one's got the CVT in it, I would be buying one tomorrow just as a rally cross toy. Is it, uh, is it a weird color? No, it's white on black, with black wheels. It actually, it looks pretty good. It got a facelift, I want to say, 2018. Um, and the car looks actually pretty good right now for what it is. It's not as dopey looking as it looked when it first came here. I don't know. If I'm, if I'm going to drive a car that cheap and that small, I think I would rather take $16,000 and import the Tata Nano from like India and drive around in the super rare, uh, super cool cheap as you know crazy cheap car uh the mitsubishi is just i i haven't i haven't driven one i you know i i hear about when some people buy them and they get they get you know ribbed on for buying it and you know i usually i usually say my my philosophy is that most cars for sale today are good like when we review cars it's not separating the bad cars from the good cars it's usually trying to distinguish the great cars from the good cars but there are still a few cars that just aren't good, and this seems to fall below that line. <laughs> so uh, are you reviewing it? Yes, and I would say this. It's a car. It's good enough if, for whatever reason, they approve your credit or the dealer's selling them for cheap. If this is what you can get, it gets the job done. It's got AC. It's got cruise control. It's got like a touchscreen you know, infotainment system with Apple CarPlay. That said, if you're paying full price, there are a lot of other much better cars for 16.9 there's a lot better used cars for 16.9 yeah. i mean just go but it is know. nice that it has a full warranty and it's it's got a tiny three-cylinder engine but in theory it gets like 40 something miles per gallon on the highway the, i'm defending what really isn't that defensible at this price but i understand that some people 
want that warranty and maybe the, this dealer will give them with their credit, you know, what they have that they're like, we'll get you in a Mirage or it's $7,000 off sticker. So you're actually paying 8K, but it's sticker. It's tough to argue. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll be interested to see what your score is on our 10 point scale for the review. Um, if it, if it beats five, I'll be impressed five out of 10. Um, all right, Simon, how about you? What have you been driving this week? Uh, Simon has been driving a Nissan Altima uh, SV with a Pro Pilot. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's basic transportation uh, 2019 version. It means it's, there's I a lot feel of... Like the, Go ahead, sorry. I kind of feel like the I kind of feel like the current Altima is the Camry of our age. Like the Camry, the current Camry has gotten so wild in its design that I just don't look at it as that basic transportation anymore. Like you have to be okay with its polarizing design. But then I look at the Altima, and the Altima to me is like that every man's car that you know you just drive if you kind of don't care. Um, and and I don't know, maybe that sounds like a slight, but you can sell a lot of those cars. There's no, a lot of people out there who I think just that's exactly want what, a basic car. What Nissan wants, actually. Yeah. And in and, and, and this car, like, their sales have been growing and growing. They gave it this uh, pleasing styling that is not as generic as a bit of personality to it. And, and, and I like it. I enjoy it. And, and the interior is very nice. It's, it's years ahead of what Nissan used to do inside their cars. Uh, it, it has a very pleasing, almost German feel to it. And, um, and Propilot works just fine just fine so uh and 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 the cvt is completely offensive you don't realize it's there which is fine like you mean maybe yeah you, their cvts have gotten a lot better yeah oh my god yes they have they used to be terrible <laughs> like like every cvt uh, this, this technology as time progresses technology tends to get better so uh and is the ultimate you're driving all-wheel drive because that's new for no this it's too. not sadly it isn't okay yeah it feels it feels pretty light to, though, so that's that's a good part. If you, yeah, if you I'd like, like to ask ask Nissan what the take rate is for all wheel drive on the on the new Altimas, um, just to, just to see if it's was worth adding. Um, so, okay, well that's a that's a. Um, I was gonna say that's an interesting car, but it's not really an interesting car. It's it's kind of like the Mirage. It's a car. But um, yeah, but I like it better than the Mirage, them. though. I said with Greg and the Mirage, and, <laughs> and, and I wanted to jump out. Yeah, no, that's good. I think I think you probably got the better end of that deal. So, um, so the car I'm driving this week is a little different than what you guys are driving. I have the keys to a McLaren 720s Spider. And this um, this car uh, breaks records for me in terms of um, cars that I've driven or have have been loaned for review. Um, it is both the most powerful at well over 700 horsepower and the most expensive at four hundred and eleven thousand um, dollars. So it has been it has been actually quite terrifying to drive the car uh, to back. It's been terrifying to back it out of my driveway because I have a thin driveway with a brick wall on one side. Uh, and the last thing I want to do is like, you know, rip off a side view mirror. Um, and then um, fortunately, it comes with a little button you press to raise the suspension when when you're like, you can only press it below 40 miles an hour. It'll raise the suspension so you, you can like pull in your driveway or whatever. And I basically, I have to use it to get out of my driveway. And then any like parking lot I pull into, anytime I pull off the main road, I got to hit it again to you know just make sure i don't scrape the 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 front lip spoiler on something um but look it's amazing it is um i haven't i haven't had a chance to find a safe space to you know really put my foot down uh but what little i have been able to do is it the, the car is telepathic it it this the steering is instant and accurate and full of communication the the you know the engine is like i said i haven't there, there's so much power i've barely tapped into it just driving around i actually i took it grocery shopping and there is no trunk but there is a frunk and it's actually a pretty big front trunk um so it took all of my groceries but obviously like you know like i said i couldn't really dip into the engine um what has surprised me so far is that um just tooling around town in the normal suspension setting it is actually pretty comfortable. It, the, the suspension is not punishing 
at all. It's actually pretty compliant. Like this is this is in, insane to say, but like I could daily drive this if I had more money than I knew what to do with. Uh, but I could drive this every day. It's not that hard to get in and out of considering what it is. There's, you know, that it has the kind of scissor doors and you have to get over a little bit of a sill, but it's not like getting into a BMW i8, which is the most ungraceful thing you could do. Um, much easier to get into, into and out of this. Um, and all the controls are easy to operate. Like it really was actually pretty easy to get in and drive around. Um, so I have it, um, over this holiday weekend and I'm going to go to some barbecues with it. Um, it has attracted crowds wherever I've gone, um, at the grocery store, people came up to me. Um, and, and actually even just in my driveway, um, people have just walked up my driveway and started talking to me, uh, about this car. So it's been an experience. Um, you know, it's, it's so outlandish, $411,000, you know, to to review it is ridiculous because it's not like somebody who buys it is going to read a car magazine and say, oh, I think I'm going to spend my $411,000 on that instead of the $411,000 Ferrari because of what this guy said. But it is, it is just uh, an experience like, like no other. Um, I've driven some expensive cars before and some fast cars, um, and this is at the very top of that list. So, um It'll be interesting. We're going to have a review of it um, coming up pretty soon. So we'll be, I'll be interested to see what that scores on the 10-point scale. Um, definitely, I'm thinking above a 5. So, all right. Well, that is it for this episode of the Motor One podcast. Uh, you can follow Greg at The Finker on Twitter. And Simon, I forgot to get your Twitter handle. Um, my, do you have one that you can share? Yes, my Twitter handle is Simon. Gomez V is a Victor, S I M O N G O M E Z V. Great. And you can follow me at, on Twitter at John underscore M underscore Neff. Um, I want to thank you two for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. And thanks, of course, for everyone out there listening. And we'll talk to you next week.